I'm Dr. Sean Williams, and I'm writing about the history of the hairdresser and how their role has evolved in society since the 18th century. Above all, I'm interested in the hairdresser as a character of cultural representation, how the hairdresser has been represented on the page in novels such as Pietro Belcampo in E.T.A. Hoffmann's German novel The Devil's Elixir, or on stage, or on screen, and so on. The overarching point of this research is that the hairdresser since the 18th century is consistently represented as somehow an outsider. The hairdresser is highly individualized. And yet, the hairdresser also mediates mainstream fashion trends and what we call master narratives of identity for clients. In other words, the hairdresser embodies both cultural alterity and, in conflict with that, cultural norms as well. And so the hairdresser stands in for a study of the everyday self since modernity began. The hairdresser's significance in society first rose as the importance of the wig maker fell. The term hairdresser was coined in 18th century England. This character was also called the coiffeur and friseur, terms that passed through French, English, German and other vocabularies in the same period. Since the late 17th and early 18th centuries, wigs had become ever more popular, passing into fashions of wider social classes until they became so widespread that they reached a tipping point. According to Memoirs of an Old Wig, a humorous novel published in 1815, the wig as an object of social status and fashion had apparently lost its former dignity by that point, falling from salubrious drawing rooms into a shoe polisher's bag. Wigs, hair and hairdressers often make good material for satire. Amusingly, in a German play by Heinrich von Kleist called The Broken Jug, published around a similar time, a cat has kittens in a wig. A major difference between wig makers and hairdressers was that wig makers were guild members. They had a fixed and long-term relationship with their places of work and with their customers. People would return to wig makers for alterations, aftercare, or to trade in their old wig for a more fashionable one. Hairdressers, by contrast, were freelancers, not guild members. And barbers, who until the mid-18th century were part of guilds of surgeons, were increasingly free of regulative structures and formal responsibility, too. Barbers had previously let blood and pulled teeth, but the late 18th century saw great advances in medicine and dentistry. The socio-legal division between wig makers and hairdressers led, I think, to Immanuel Kant's distinction that whereas we make use of the labouring hairdresser, the wig maker is his own master and produces a work or opus. For Kant, the wig maker is not a mere service provider like the hairdresser, servant or casual worker. Together with the tailor, the wig maker is rather an artisan and a citizen of the state. Look at this wonderful cartoon from the Special Collections at the University of Sheffield Library, drawn in the early 19th century by George Cruikshank. It depicts the controversy of the hairdresser as a new type of freelancer, who was sometimes expensive. What's your terms, Mr. Frism? A guinea an hour, my lady. A guinea an hour? Is the labourer worthy of his hire? But Kant was out of step with the way fashion and modernity was developing. Hairdressing was a practice through which a young person could both gain entry into and rise up within society. The heyday for wig makers had long passed. The surge in hairdressers was unstoppable. Hairdressers did not advance in society through their formal qualifications, but via charisma and opportunism instead. This led to an increase of the hairdresser in cultural representation around 1800, portrayed as illegitimate children and as itinerants, for example, among other ways of presenting them as outsiders who turned themselves into important and respectable characters. Most of all, then, hairdressers were represented as exemplary of this self-made individual, someone who, from the margins of society, became central to modern late 18th century life 
and could make something of themselves by their own means within an increasingly laissez-faire economy. Although this image of the hairdresser has changed over time, in our creative economy today, the hairdresser is still representative of a self-made individual, often still a sole trader or franchisee. If you'd like to read more about my work, you can find more sources and an open access article on my homepage, and you can follow me on Twitter at Wiggish History. Thank <laughs> you.